Hello, good morning. Welcome to this service from Grange Methodist Nance. It's good to gather together, even if it's a bit of a strange way to gather. Um, so here we are. Yes, I'm trying to remember what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start this morning with a, um, a new... Uh, a new, well, it's a new song, but it's an old song. It's um, apparently one of the oldest fishy music songs, um, but it's not one we've ever done before. Uh, but it's also actually, it's an old hymn revamped. So it's got a bit, bit of a folky feel and um, you might recognise it. I hope you join in. And I love, I've chosen it particularly because I love the words of the last verse, which is the one that um, I think... Um, Fishy have contributed. And I'm very grateful to Stephen Fishbacker, who uh, I've been in communication in the last uh, few days to actually get the chords for this. <laughs> through new life is overdue come and be born anew alleluia amen we're going to begin our prayers with a psalm this morning psalms of course really are prayers um, many of them at least and psalm 139 or some verses from it are going to lead us into our prayer You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. You see us, God. You see where we go. Whether that's simply from armchair to kitchen, or out for daily exercise, or going out to a place of work. Each one an expression of our care and service. You see when we cry tears of loneliness or frustration. You see when we find joy, even among restrictions. You see us. You know us, God. You know our inmost hopes. You know what makes us feel alive. You know the things that weigh us down and fill us with dread. You know what and who we place our trust in. And you know our questions and our doubts. You know us. Perhaps this makes us afraid Afraid because we know we do not always live as fearfully and wonderfully made children. Sometimes we mess up, sometimes without meaning to, sometimes deliberately choosing the destructive path. Sometimes we feel we cannot help ourselves. But we are sorry. You see us and you know us, and yet you still love us. You love us through our faults and failings. Nothing we get wrong can ever surprise you or drive you away from us. You continue to love us into the wholeness of life that you have always intended for us. And so we praise you. Thank you that you invite us to pray with confidence as Jesus taught his friends to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we're going to have a little reprise of the uh, song we introduced last week, Neither Death Nor Life. Jesus, 
Our first reading this morning, uh, well, apart from the psalm, which we had earlier, of course, um, is the story of Samuel called by God. Samuel lived in the temple in the care of Eli, who was an old and failing priest. Eli's own sons had gone completely off the rails, so it's very strange that he should be entrusted with this young boy. But just a few years before today's reading takes place, Hannah, Samuel's mother, had been in the same temple, crying bitter tears and praying in desperation to God because she was childless. And she promised God that if she had a son, she would dedicate him to God. And so when Hannah did become pregnant and give birth to a son, she calls him Samuel, which sounds like God hears. And when he's weaned, Hannah takes him to the temple and leaves him there to be brought up by Eli in the service of God. Uh, so thank you to Alan who reads for us. Good morning. 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 to 10. The Lord calls Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord and Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel answered, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went, lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Last week for our gospel reading, we heard about Jesus' baptism from Mark's gospel. This week more or less follows on from that point, but from John's gospel instead. And the day after Jesus' baptism, Jesus begins to call disciples. He begins with two disciples of John the Baptist who see him and begin to follow him. And Jesus asks what they want. They ask Jesus where he's staying and Jesus says, well, come and see. One of them, Andrew, then goes to find his brother, Simon, Simon who becomes um, Peter. And he brings him to Jesus and says nothing less dramatic than we have found the Messiah. So now we hear about a few more who came along after that. Thanks to Mary for reading. John 1, verses 43 to 51. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, 
Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thank you to both of you. Our next hymn is based on Psalm 139. It describes the God who knows us, who knows when Samuel lies down and gets up, who knows the thoughts of Nathaniel, and who knows us too. It's number 728 in Singing the Faith. Oh God, you search me and you know me. Last week, we were thinking about the covenant, the Methodist covenant, as a relationship, as it being about our acceptance of the place that God offers to us in that relationship. It's not something that we earn by our hard work or good deeds or even the promises that we make, but simply by opening, uh, but simply it's opened to us by God for us to choose whether we want to stand in that relationship with God, to give ourselves to God. I am no longer my own, but yours. Here I am. Here I am. I wonder what those, what feelings, those words stir in you. Excitement, perhaps. God, here I am. What adventures are we going to have together? Or maybe a feeling of resignation. Here I am. I can't fight it anymore. I must just accept that I can't do this on my own and I have to look to God. Or maybe a feeling of fear. 
here I am, I really don't know what I'm letting myself in for or where you'll take me and it's a bit scary. It's a very vulnerable thing to say, here I am, to God. Of course, when Samuel said, here I am, he was actually speaking to old Eli. He probably thought when he heard that voice calling his name, that Eli was asking for a drink or help getting out of bed or something like that. Samuel at that point didn't understand whose voice was calling his name. Until Eli finally twigged. The voice that Samuel heard in the temple was the voice of God. Who'd have thought that God would speak in the temple? It clearly wasn't something they were used to or expecting. I wonder how Samuel felt as he invited God to speak to him. Because saying, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, or here I am, is never going to be the end of the conversation. It's just the beginning. And you know that God means business when your name's called twice. It happens to lots of people through the Bible. Abraham, Abraham. Abraham says, here I am. And God says, stop, don't harm your son. I'm going to bless you and give you many descendants, more than you can count. And Jacob, Jacob. And Jacob says, here I am. And God says, don't be afraid. Take your whole family and go and make your home in Egypt. And again, God says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. And God says, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and lead my people out into freedom. Samuel, Samuel, here I am. And God gives Samuel a glimpse of the difficult future ahead. We didn't hear that part of the reading, but God tells Samuel that Eli's family would be wiped out because of their wrongdoing and that everything was going to change for the nation. God carries on saying people's names twice into the New Testament. uh, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things, but what Mary has chosen will not be taken away from her. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, you will deny me three times. And then even after the resurrection, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, Why are you persecuting me? So hearing God call your name twice is a moment to stop and hold on and wait for what might be a challenging message. Each of these, each of these people has a story that we could follow and spend lots of time exploring all the challenge and the joy that there was ahead for them in following the call of God. Some of them, I'm sure, felt that that call was a mistake. In fact, we know that some felt like that. Sometimes people joke about responding when we hear God and saying, here I am, Lord, send someone else. But after Moses said, here I am, and God told him what he wanted him to do, Moses made one excuse after another until finally he literally said, God, I don't want to do it. Please send someone else. But the call to us is no mistake. The one who calls us is the one who created us, the one who knit us together, who knows us inside out. God knew all about Abraham. He knew that Abraham had lied about his wife to try and save his own skin. He knew that Abraham had been unable to fully trust God's promise of a son and would actually go on to try and sort things out for himself by having a son with his wife's servant, and then actually would go on to treat them very badly. God knew all about Jacob, that Jacob was a cheat, and that Moses was a murderer. He knew that Peter would deny him, and he knew that Saul was trying to have all Jesus' followers put to death. These giants in the Bible stories were not perfect, 
And God knew that. God knew the worst of them. And still that call on their lives was no mistake. And neither is it a mistake when God calls you. But the important thing is that that call needs us to respond. It comes to a point when we can't stand and be an onlooker and try to understand it from the outside. We just have to jump in and explore it for ourselves. Samuel didn't really understand yet who was calling him or what that meant. He had to say, speak, Lord. And through that experience of hearing God with his own ears, Samuel would grow in understanding of who God was and what God was calling him to. It actually says a little bit further on that The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. He did not let any of Samuel's messages fail to come true. And then all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a true prophet of the Lord. Samuel had to grow in that relationship with God and grow in his understanding of all that he was called to. And it's not that different with Nathaniel. When Philip finds Nathaniel and tells him about Jesus... Nathaniel is full of scepticism. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? How could this be the person we've been waiting for? But Philip says, come and see for yourself. And so Nathaniel does. He sees it with his own eyes. And that was what he needed. It changes his whole perspective. Just imagine if Nathaniel had refused to come and see. He wouldn't have seen it for himself. He'd only have that second-hand report. But he needed to experience it for himself and to meet with Jesus himself. At Jesus' birth, the shepherds were invited to come and see. And the Magi also needed to see with their own eyes. We haven't explored uh, this year, or at least not yet, the story of Simeon and Anna when the baby Jesus was presented in the temple. But Simeon took him in his arms and praised God that that he had at last seen with his own eyes. There's something really important about that first-hand experience. That relationship with God that we talked about last week isn't something we can understand or experience second-hand. Just to remind you, those words I read from Jeremiah last week say, I will be their God and they will be my people. People will no longer need to teach their neighbours and relatives to know me, for all of them, from the least important to the most important, will know me. We will each have that relationship with God for ourselves. So when we say, here I am, we may start by kind of, I suppose, sitting on the edge and testing the water with our toes, But we'll only fully know how the water will support us when we jump in. And I suppose that's what the covenant prayer invites us to do. Next week we will, I mean I meant to put these words up uh, online for you to find on Facebook, on YouTube and to send them to uh, Andrew to put on the website and I haven't done that yet, I will do it. Next week, we will invite you, if you wish, to join in saying the words of the covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things. Wherever you place me, in all that I do and in all that I may endure. When there's work for me and when there is none. When I am troubled and when I am at peace. Your will be done when I'm valued and when I'm disregarded. When I find fulfilment and when it is lacking. When I have all things and when I have nothing. I willingly offer all I have and am to serve you as and where you choose. Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. May it be so forever. Let this covenant now made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen.
That is truly jumping in with both feet, being fully immersed, throwing ourselves into God. I think we often fear that if we let go of ourselves like this, we will become less. We can be afraid of losing part of ourselves and want to hold something back. That's only natural. But actually, how can we ever be lost in God when God is the God who knows our inmost being, who knows our getting up and our lying down, who knows every thought and every word, who has known us since before we were born? I don't think we lose ourselves by throwing ourselves into God's arms like this. I think that actually God calls us into something much bigger than ourselves. And in accepting that call, in giving ourselves away, our lives become more, not less. And of course, we all know the words that Jesus said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. I think that's what we're called to do in joining in the covenant prayer together. It's inviting us into that life, which is so much bigger than if we aren't willing to give ourselves to God. We're going to sing again now. It's number 673. Will you come and follow me?
So we come to time to pray for the world around us and um, we have a response for you to join in. When I say, Lord, you call us, I invite you to join with the words, help us to hear and respond. Lord, you call us, help, help us, us to, to hear, hear and, and respond. respond. Living God, there are many ways we hear your voice. We hear the cries of hungry families reliant on food parcels. We hear of those living on the streets, even in this country where so many have so much. We hear people who inspire us by their determination to help. Lord, you call us. Help, Help us, us to, to hear, hear and respond. We hear of communities and nations divided and in conflict. We hear of communities pulling together finding ways to care for those in need. We hear from leaders who don't have all the answers and need our prayers. Lord, you call us. Help, Help us, us to, to hear, hear and respond. respond. We hear of friends, relations, neighbours and colleagues falling ill. We hear of the exhaustion of medical staff and care home workers caring for those who are sick. We, we hear the hope of vaccination clinics. Lord, you call us. Help, Help us, us to, to hear, hear and, and respond. respond. We hear the sadness and frustration of people who are lonely and whose lives feel empty. We hear from people struggling to juggle working at home and helping children learn. We hear of people losing their jobs and wondering how they will get through. Lord, you call us. Help Lord, us to, to hear, hear and respond. respond. We hear of faith communities hit hard by the pandemic and struggling to survive. We hear of faith communities giving practical help and serving others. We hear of faith communities sharing your life and hope in fresh ways. Lord, you call us. Help, Help us to, to hear, hear and, and respond. Living God, there are many ways we hear your voice. Help us stop and listen. Help us to have the wisdom to discern what we hear and the courage to say, here I am and the faith to follow where you lead us. We ask this and all our prayers in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen.
next week we're going to think a little bit more about where that calling might take us if we are willing to follow. Um, but now we sing our final hymn, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. It's number 663 in Singing the Faith. So as we go into the coming week, may each of us know that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that each one of us is called by name by the God who loves us. Let's share the grace together. May, may the, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.